Okay, today we're going to talk about Rotifera and Mollusca, those two phylum of the animal kingdom. So you are going to need your chart for the phylum Mollusca um, because we're going to go through several different classes and you will be filling out chart information. I'll go ahead and tell you that I'm not going to narrate this entire PowerPoint presentation because when we get to the chart information, you can just pause the video and fill out that information for yourself. I don't need to read a slide for you. So um, in fact, we're going to start with Rotifera. I only have one slide on it. Um, just want to show you that, but keeping in mind that we are still looking at invertebrates. So here is our Rotifera. This is exactly what it looks like. It only has one organism in it called a rotifer. So the rotifer have um, what we call a crown on top of its head where it has rings of cilia here as well as here and that's how it moves throughout the water column and it ingests food through its mouth and through its pharynx and here is the digestive system in here. It also has um, a foot that allows it to attach to a certain um, substrate. Now what it can do is it can attach to a substrate and then use this cilia to draw water across it and as the water comes in then it can trap um, smaller organisms like maybe amoeba or paramecium into its digestive tract and you'll get to see these in labs as well so they are their own um, grouping. So we're just going to look at these features real quickly because we have chapter 28 that has the invertebrates and then in chapter 29 we're going to start with our vertebrates um, so all the different parts of animals um, but what both of them have in common are they have a colon or a partial colon um, they have three germ labor layers remember they were triploblasts um, and then the ones we're looking at today have a complete digestive tract. That means they have a mouth and an anus. Um, and they have organ systems as well. And all of these are ingestive heterotrophs. So that's what they all have in common. So let's first start with our colum. We've talked about this several times, but um, by definition, it is a body cavity that holds all the organs and the fluid, and it's isolated from the digestive tract. And remember, um, for it to be a true colon, it has to have mesodermal lining the entire way. That's not always the case, um, in which case it would be um, a pseudocolon. But if you look here, um, here is our colon or body cavity, which is separate from the gut or the digestive tract entirely. Okay? So what, wh why does that matter? Why do we care if we have a, di uh, have a colon or not? Well, three different reasons. One is it provides space for the development of an organ um, so that it has um, space to protect it while it's developing. And secondly is that it cushions the organs from injury, so that just an extra layer and then as the organs grow and move, they can do that independently from the rest of the body because they have a place for that to occur. So those are the advantages of having a colon. So this is just my um, reminder for you. Our protostomes that we've been talking about, the mouth develops first um, from the blastopore. And we've already talked about Annelida, those were our segmented worms, they were our protostomes. Um, but today we're going to start continuing with Mollusca. So that's where that falls in. And then um, we're going to later carry on with the arthropods. Those are our protostomes. Later we're going to talk more about the deuterostomes, which are more highly developed. And that's where the anus develops first from that blastopore. And we're going to talk about the echinoderms as well as the chordates. So that'll be a little bit later, but where we are focusing on today is our mollusca. Okay, so what does mollusca even mean? Um, it, it means soft-bodied animals, so things that 
look familiar to you probably are um, like a snail has a soft body, clams inside have a soft body, um, this right here is a cuttlefish, squids, um, this is a nautilus, it has a shell but inside the bodies are soft, so those are our mollusks, again in a water environment. So here is the general body plan of a mollusk. A, a mollusk. Again, bilateral symmetry. Um, it has, it contains what we call a visceral mass that is covered with soft epithelium, and that's where the organs are contained. Um, its digestion, excretion, and reproduction organs are contained within the visceral mass. So that's this large section here. It also has what we call a mantle, and that mantle um, can produce a shell. It doesn't always, but it can. And then it also has a muscular foot for motility. So structural features that um, unite this phylum all together, uh, most of them you just heard in the body plan, um, but there's the visceral mass containing the internal organs, the foot, which is that large muscle for motility, the mantle, um, and the reason it's called a mantle is, is because it's a fold of tissue that goes over the visceral mass, and that's the one that can secrete a shell. The fourth one that I didn't mention in the other um, slide is what's called a radula. Now, radula is an organ that works like a scraping tongue. So the way I like to think of it is um, if you look at a bulldozer and what what's there instead of the wheels, that big, um, what would you call that? Like a, almost like a conveyor belt, but it has notches in it that allow it to grab into the surface of the ground. A radula looks like that and acts like that. So here is an image of the radula that we were talking about, and this is up close under the microscope. So you can see these tiny little points um, they're like spikes almost, and in a row, so just like um, several backhoes in a row, they can scrape out um, any kind of food like from a shell or something like that. They can just scoop it out and um, then it goes into their digestive system. So that is the radula. Other things that you will want to know about our um, mollusks is they can either have completely separate sexes so uh, one organism being male, the other being female, that would be dioecious. Um, or they can be hermaphrodites, also called monoecious, and have the same sex on one particular organism. And sometimes they can actually change that. So they can go from being male to then female. So they have um, very uh, kind of a unique way of looking at male versus female. They can either be separate sexes or hermaphrodites. Okay, their nervous system. Um, again, a huge range um, within our mollusks. Um, some of them have very little uh, nervous system, just very basic, such as in the clam. There's not like this big brain or anything. Um, and then others like our octopus and squid have very complex nervous systems. Um, Hopefully we'll get to talk about it um, in lab, if you get to go to lab, uh, but an octopus or a squid can problem solve and imitate, so they have very complex nervous systems. Okay, so we're going to start with our class polyplacophora, and the word polyplaca means many plates. And so our example of this are these chitons in this image. Um, they actually have eight plates, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, um, along their back, and that protects them but still allows them to move. The image on the top right is what they look like in nature. They can be very colorful. What you will see in the lab is going to be preserved, so it's going to look a little more like the ones um, in the middle of the page. So, um, But we will be seeing that, and next slide gives you a bunch of features on it.
I couldn't move on from the chitons without telling you just some neat information that was actually discovered at Duke um, right down the road in 2011. Um, it turns out that these chitons actually have eyes and their eyes are made up of what we call argonite, which is actually like a rock or a crystal. So as you can see in this image, it's all these dark ones and they have lots of them. So prior to that, we didn't even know they had that. So they do have a rudimentary um, eyesight. Okay, our next class are the gastropods. Gastro meaning uh, stomach, pod meaning foot. So that is what they are mostly made up of, right? Their stomach and their foot. Um, and this is where you see the snails and the nudibranches, which are so pretty. Conchs, if, you, if you've ever collected a conch shell, um, they fall into this category as well. So just a little extra non-chart information, uh, land snails as well as slugs, which don't have uh, a shell, um, they secrete a mucus so that they can move along a wet surface. Also, our gastropods are hermaphrodites as well, but this is the first time that we actually see a copulatory organ. So they have a penis to actually deliver the sperm. So remember we said, you know, each grouping that we look at, we're wanting to see, well, what kind of advancements do they have? What kind of adaptations do they have? So this is where we first see a copulatory organ. Such a unique feature that I really wanted to point out are the nudibranches. They are sea slugs that are solar powered. Um, what they do is they eat green algae and then keep the chloroplasts from them that allow them to undergo their own photosynthesis. Now, having said that, they don't pass that along to the next generation. So when they produce new baby nudibranches, those nudibranches again have to eat the green algae in order to obtain the chloroplasts. I had a student in one of my classes, uh, I believe it was last semester, who said, okay, but that sort of contradicts our endosymbiotic theory that we were talking about where organisms would ingest chloroplasts and then they could pass it on to the next generation. So that was something to think about. Um, I just thought it was an interesting topic, so something for you to mull over, but they are really neat organisms. Oh yeah, the other neat thing about nudibranches is uh, not only can they maintain those chloroplasts, they also prey upon Portuguese man of war and they retain um, the nematocysts. Remember that was where um, the nidocytes contain these nematocysts that can sting so, and often uh, contain toxins. So the nudibranches can maintain that as well and use it as a self-defense. Okay, our next class is bivalvia. And these are the bivalves. These are probably something you're very familiar with. And so they have the two shells, the two halves of the shells, and that's why they're called bivalves. But these are our clams, mussels, oysters. Um, if you enjoy eating those, this should look very familiar to you. Um, one thing some people don't know is clams have these eyes. I just wanted to point those out because this picture shows them really well all along the edge. These are rudimentary eyes. So let's take a look at the anatomy of a clam because this is something y'all are going to need to know. Um, I've already pointed out the eyes um, right near the shell and um, they also have tentacles on the mantle as well. They can kind of see where they're see where they are but also feel where they are based on those tentacles. We are going to do a dissection of this in the lab um, so it might actually be helpful for you to pick pull up this image when you're doing that dissection so you know what you're looking at. Um, so they have a foot right here that's this entire big muscle and they use that to dig into the uh, the sand and stay in its little substrate they have 
what we call adductor muscles. That's these right here. There's two large ones. That's what holds the clam together. So when you start to open up a clam, that is what you cut first in order to be able to open it up. They are filter feeders, so they have an in-current siphon to bring the water in. They can take out the debris and then the excurrent siphon to let out the rest of the water. Now, once it comes through, um, it does have a stomach right here and um, then also has all these intestines that everything passes through and then back out the anus. So it has a complete digestive system. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it has a heart right here with there's its aorta. It also has a kidney and then it has um, kind of what we call posterior ganglion. That's the very simple nervous system that we were talking about. And this is where we start to see um, some respiratory organs for a, for a change. So here are the gills that they contain and that allows it to uh, extract oxygen out of the water column. Okay, I think that is all you need to know. Um, we can talk a little bit more later about an open and closed um, circulatory system. This one would be, um, I believe this one is an open circulatory system, which basically just means that the hemolymph, instead of blood, fills the cavities, doesn't have a whole lot of arteries and veins, that type of thing. Okay, so you've learned that a bivalve can um, create a pearl. So what is a pearl exactly? It's a concentric layer of nacre um, formed around an irritant, usually a parasite or a piece of sand or something that's irritated the, um, the clam. So there's a cultured pearl and then there's the natural pearl. And if you know anything about jewelry, which I know very little, um, but I do know this, a natural pearl is much more expensive than a cultured pearl. And this is why. Because in a cultured pearl, a human places a bead inside the bivalve and retrieves it about six months later. Later, sorry. <coughs> and it just has a thin layer of nacre on it. Um, a natural pearl, um, by contrast, has a tiny irritant and the bivalve uh, spontaneously produces lots and lots of layers of nacre. So, when you're buying a cultured pearl, that means that it's mostly just a bead with a little bit of real pearl on it. A natural pearl is um, complete knacker, except for a tiny, tiny irritant. So that's why a natural pearl is so much more expensive than a cultured pearl. Okay, class cephalopoda. These are our squids, our nautilus, our cuttlefish, and our octopus. Remember we keep talking about cephalization, meaning uh, a centralized ganglia or a brain? Well, so that this group is called cephalopod, brain, foot, because it has the foot, but these are very intelligent creatures. Okay, just some information that's not on your chart that's pretty interesting is that our cephalopods have advanced eyes that can actually form a real image, not, very, not rudimentary eyesight. It has a closed circulatory system. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about what that means later, but for now, just know that a closed circulatory system means that the blood is contained within arteries and veins. Um, it isn't just dumped into a cavity. And then, like I said, they're extremely intelligent, which makes them good predators, and they can learn, and they can play. So this is just one study that the results of really do demonstrate how intelligent 
um, an octopus can be. So they basically train two groups of octopus, octopuses, octopi, um, one to attack a white ball and one to attack a red ball. Um, when you put adjacent cages or adjacent tanks together and allow just an observer octopus to watch one of the trained octopuses, the observer learns to attack the ball that is put into its tank because it watched the previously trained octopus. So it, it watches, it learns, so it's very um, intelligent. And this is just one of the simple experiments that demonstrated how intelligent octopi can be. Okay, so I just wanted to point this out. Um, there are um, cephalopods that are extremely large, much larger than you and me. Um, there are the giant squids and even the colossal squids. So in this image down here on the right, it has a question mark with the colossal squid, but recently they have actually found one. Um, so I'll try to link that article on your Sakai site. Um, but when you compare it to the largest marine mammal, the blue whale, you can look at the giant squid is almost the same size and the colossal squid is getting pretty close. So it's not something I would want to see, to be honest with you, in um, in person. Now, I wouldn't mind seeing one once it's brought up, but they live very, very deep in the ocean where it is dark. So anyway, just wanted to let you know about that because it's just a fascinating organism. Another cephalopod is the cuttlefish. And again, I'm going to try to link a video in Sakai for you. Um, cuttlefish have a bunch of different pigments on their skin, but because of their cephalization, they use it in a way that we haven't seen in any other creature. It can use it to camouflage itself and hide. It can also um, do flashes of light to terrify a predator. Um, it can cause all kinds of different patterns to happen because it can um, flash some pigments in one part of their body and not in another. So it is, it's like the chameleon of the sea, but way better than a chameleon. So look for the uh, link to that in Sakai. If for some reason it's not there, please send me an email and make sure I remember to put that up there. <laughs> 